This is Matt Dillahunty from the Atheist Experience, and I am a proud LGBT ally. Coming to you on Secular Media Network, this is the Gatheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. I'm your host, Callie Wright, and I'm joined, as always, today by my co-host, Jonathan Moore. Hi! And Daniel Wolfsong. Hey, everyone. Today we've got some Gatheist news, and we're also going to do an interview with Trav Mamone, who is a genderqueer person and host of the By Any Means podcast. We'll talk to them about their show and what exactly it means to be genderqueer. Before we jump into the show, I want to remind everyone that I will be at ReasonCon in Hickory, North Carolina, April 25th, where I'll be joining some fellow atheist podcasters to absolutely ruin them in a game of Skeppardy, which, as its name implies, is a skeptic-themed version of Jeopardy. If you're going to be there that weekend, I'd absolutely love to meet you and give you a hug. Tickets are still available at ReasonNC.com. So first thing today, I want to revisit for a minute the subject of last week's show. We all remember the Indiana Religious Freedom Bill that was passed, and I'm sure by now we've all heard about the stupid pizza place. And um, I just, I can't go without commenting. This place has made over $800,000 for standing up to proclaim their bigotry. Their claim is that God is rewarding them for standing up for their faith. This kind of thing kills me. $800,000 for saying not welcome here. If I would have felt like being even more pissed off about this than I already was, I would have searched through some GoFundMe pages for, well, you know, kids with cancer, people who've lost their homes to natural disasters, people who've fallen on hard times because they've lost their jobs, and I would have been even more pissed off. If, of course, that was a thing that I did. But I didn't. Because I don't want to go completely cynical. I'd love to have at least a glimmer of faith left in humanity. But alas, we have the internet. And pictures floating around show crowdfunding campaigns for kids with cancer that have like $1,500 over two months juxtaposed with bigot pizza for $800,000. Now, of course, we as atheists don't believe that a God was involved in any of this. But if you do believe a God was involved with this, you have to admit that it looks a whole lot like your God cares more for a bigoted pizza shop owner than kids dying of diseases he created in the first place. But no, 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 no. The, the moral high ground is yours. You're the one standing up for real morality here. You know, this reminds me of uh, when the CEO of Chick-fil-A, uh, when it came to light that uh, he was using company profits to donate to anti-gay groups like uh, funding the kill the gays bill in Uganda and things like that. And Bickus just flocked to Chick-fil-A and there was this huge outpouring of support. I mean, Chick-fil-A, there were lines going out the door. Chick-fil-A is all over the country. Uh, oh yeah. That's what I was going to say. They had a holiday. Yeah. They had like a Chick-fil-A day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and one thing that I, I, one story I saw is the fact that, you know, food pantries are running empty but they can give eight hundred thousand dollars to these people you know why aren't they donating their money to people that that actually you know are having a hard time yeah and 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 what's really cool about this is i uh i I was doing some research to to find to do some fact finding for this and so the the o'connors the the family that owned this place so you know it's a legitimate thing like are they just keeping the eight hundred thousand dollars or what are they going to do with it so um, their new financial advisor apparently said that their money will go to quote unquote some charities as well as to Baronel Stutzman. Now, for those who don't remember, Baronel Stutzman was a Washington florist who was found guilty of violating a Washington law against discrimination based on sexual orientation. She refused flowers to a gay couple in 2013, was fined a thousand dollars, but a GoFundMe campaign raised more than one hundred and forty seven thousand dollars dollars but she needs more money yeah I, i'm kind of confused why the o'connors are donating to her i guess it's just i think it's probably just a symbolic gesture of solidarity like you know we'll uh we gotta stick together folks like us type thing well yeah because because they're under attack they're, because they're being persecuted right? clearly <laughs> yeah so so th- so this i mean this is the new conservative business model guys like we're going to say some really hateful and bigoted things. We're going to say them proudly and in front of as many cameras as possible, and we're going to get rich. 
Well, and and there and and there and every once in a while, just because I want to get my blood boiling, I'll listen to Rush Limbaugh, and he was talking oh, about the honey, same what thing. Are you doing? Yeah, I, I, it's good. It's, it, it's it's good to hear what the other side is saying. I and know, was, but God, he was going he was going on about how it's about freedom, 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 freedom. You know, and how by you know not letting you know people be bigots, I guess that's taking away their freedom. You know, so I guess people can be an asshole, but that doesn't mean people are going to frequent your business. And, and that's why, you know, in my opinion, they should have to put placards in their window, you know, and see how much business they get then when, when people know who's being, um, being bigoted. Yeah. I think, I think where these laws exist, if we can't get rid of them, I think that's at least a stopgap measure. Like, like you better put a, you better put a sign in your, in your window to let people know what's up. I, yeah. I, f- I fully was, support that idea. And then there was this case. Did you hear recently in Colorado? Um, a baker, um, someone came to a baker and asking them to put anti-gay slurs on a cake, and they refused, and it went to court, and the and the court uh, sided with the bakery, and now the right is up in arms about that. Yeah, so which that, is it? That was actually right. That was actually that uh, this pastor who's done a lot of YouTube videos. He's oh, oh yeah, Jake Feuerstein. Yes, yes, yes. That, oh, guy, that guy that I want to say lots of very un PG thirteen things he's, about. He uh, he's he's awful. Yeah, just this whole just this whole concept of him being thinking that telling a bakery to to put something obviously hateful and discriminatory on a cake and then refusing it that's somehow on par with a gay couple just asking <laughs> for a cake that even doesn't even have to have a specific message on it and that's and then they're, them refusing the gay couple that's somehow equal to putting something hateful on a cake in in his mind and and he can point that towards discrimination against or persecution i should say it's a false equivalency that's straight up dangerous yeah 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 uh, again john stewart the other night he was talking about this and his 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 um analogy was so uh baking catering a gay wedding is equivalent to asking a jew to dance with hitler <laughs> yeah oh. that's a that's 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 a, that's a good comparison <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's terrible but i mean but it's it it, it holds water that to me when i because mm-hmm. i i read that i read that article a few days ago and I'm just shaking my head and I just felt so angry that he would do that because of course he, you know, he goes on his YouTube channel and tells everyone, see, look what happens when we, when we want yeah. something done that goes against their beliefs. Uh, and it's like, do you, do you just not yeah. understand how humanity works? I mean, well, you know, what's yeah. funny about what he did is that, so, so I guess he's in Colorado, but, um, mm-hmm. the baker, the, the bakery that he called is in Florida, right. which first of all, he was too much of a coward to do it somewhere locally. Mm-hmm. He had to call somewhere else. Yep. Mm-hmm. But Florida is also a dual consent state, so he very likely committed a crime by recording those people without their consent. Oh, interesting. Ah. So, so that's so that's going to be fun. Um, also, something interesting to point out about Josh Feuerstein. Any of our uh, any of our atheist community listeners will probably recognize him as the um, the hundred dollar atheist or the hundred thousand dollar atheist oh. challenge guy. Oh yeah, Dis- he's the one. Um, also, the hey, Mister Atheist, let me disprove evolution in two minutes, guy. Right. Um, right. The other thing that uh, that you don't necessarily hear from his supporters is that he created a GoFundMe campaign last year to raise twenty thousand dollars to buy a Red One camera, like these really like crazy like four K three D movie cameras. He raised the twenty thousand dollars about a year ago and is still shooting his video with cell phones. So I'll let I'll let people put two and two together on that Ooh. one. Hmm. Very yeah. intriguing. <laughs> So, um, so as, as the, the queer community is wont to do, um, some folks have taken this and tried to turn it around for good. I think it's definitely worth the attention. Um, it's, you know, this is obviously not getting the attention, uh, that it should and definitely not as much as the, um, the freaking bigot pizza campaign. Okay. So Equality House is this nonprofit that set a, uh, set up the, the rainbow house across the street from Westboro Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is they've set up a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign trying to reach a hundred thousand dollars. And what they're doing is they're trying to reserve 100 hotel rooms for a year yeah. for LGBT homeless people. Nice. Which is an absolutely amazing cause, first of all, and even more so, uh, you know, trying to turn this ridiculousness around into something good. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, if there's anything that we can that we can say that you know might turn around and be somewhat positive for this. Um, <clears throat> so, any listeners, I would definitely encourage um, go to crowdrise.com slash LGBT pizza. And uh, their $100,000 uh, goal, as of the recording of this, they've reached $45,960. So just a little bit uh, less than halfway to go. Nice. Um, That's so awesome. I definitely encourage you to, to check that out and donate um, if, if, you, if you have the means. If you don't have the means, uh, you know, share the link. Tell your friends uh, because it's, it's an amazing cause and they absolutely deserve to hit that $100,000 goal. Right. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. And we will be back with Gatheus News. More Gatheus Manifesto coming up. Here's an excerpt from Fear of Physics by Lawrence Krauss. A physicist, an engineer, and a psychologist are called in as consultants to a dairy farm whose production has been below par. Each is given time to inspect the details of the operation before making a report. The first to be called is the engineer who states... The size of the stalls for the cattle should be decreased. Efficiency could be improved if the cows were more closely packed, with a net allotment of 275 cubic feet per cow. Also, the diameter of the milking tubes should be increased by 4% to allow for a greater average flow rate during the milking periods. The next report is the psychologist who proposes the inside of the barn should be painted green. This is a more mellow color than brown and should help induce greater milk flow. Also, more trees should be planted in the fields to add diversity to the scenery for the cattle during grazing to reduce boredom. Finally, the physicist is called upon. He asks for a blackboard and then draws a circle. He begins. Assume the cow is a sphere. This old joke, if not very funny, does illustrate how, at least metaphorically, Physicists picture the world. The set of tools physicists have to describe nature is limited. Most of the modern theories you read about began life as simple models by physicists who didn't know how else to start to solve a problem. These simple little models are usually based on simpler little models and so on because the class of things that we do know how to solve exactly can be counted on the fingers of one, maybe two hands. For the most part, Physicists follow the same guidelines that have helped keep Hollywood movie producers rich. If it works, exploit it. If it still works, copy it. I like the cow joke because it provides an allegory for thinking simply about the world, and it allows me to jump right into an idea that doesn't get written about too much, but that is essential for the everyday workings of science. Before doing anything else, abstract out all irrelevant details. There are two operatives here, abstract and irrelevant. Getting rid of irrelevant details is the first step in building any model of the world and we do it subconsciously from the moment we are born. Doing it consciously is another matter. Overcoming the natural desire not to throw out unnecessary information is probably the hardest and most important part of learning physics. In addition, What may be irrelevant in a given situation is not universal, but depends in most cases on what interests you. This leads us to the second operative word, abstraction. Of all the abstract thinking required in physics, probably the most challenging lies in choosing how to approach a problem. The mere description of movement along a straight line, the first major development in modern physics, required enough abstraction that it largely eluded some pretty impressive intellects until Galileo. Fear of Physics by Lawrence Krauss. Find this audiobook and many more at AtheistAudiobooks.com. The facts you won't hear in church. Welcome back to the Gatheist Manifesto. As always, we've got some serious gems in the news this week. Jonathan, what's first? Well, this week we have noted Colorado State Representative Gordon Klingenschmidt, I think is how you say that. You totally nailed it. 
Yay! <laughs> and so he's been claiming that by the end of this century, 21st century, 20% of all Americans will, quote, be recruited into the lifestyle the gay lifestyle he is referring to. I'm just going to let Senator Klingenschmidt hang himself out to dry with this one. Now let's take a moment and discern the spirits. Uh, I remember reading a report, gosh, now it's 2015, right? Five years ago when the 2010 census came out, they didn't poll sexual orientation, but they did poll the number of non-married same-sex cohabitators. And you know it was less than 1% nationwide? And that was just five years ago. Now, it's up to, they're saying, the nationwide average is uh, about 3%. So it is growing nationwide, but it's still less gay people in the South where they believe the Bible than there are on the left coast where they don't believe the Bible. This proves to me that the Bible works. That when people believe the Bible, they promote holiness and they invite the Holy Spirit to rule their hearts. They don't have all of these homosexual addiction problems that they have in places where they don't believe the Bible and they reject the Bible and they teach their children in California schools that, uh, you know, homosexuality is a good thing and they celebrate Harvey Milk Day and they have all kinds of policies to promote that in the classroom. Well, no wonder their population is growing. They're recruiting people into that movement on the left coast. This proves to me that the disparity in that population proves to me that it is a recruitment effort for your children. And thank God they're resisting that in Alabama. I wish the rest of America would protect their children as well as they do in Alabama, which is why they have a lower percentage of children recruited, according to this Gallup poll, in the state of Alabama. Now, I've also read that children of gay couples, if you have two moms, there might be a 20% chance that you'll become gay yourself. Not because you were born that way, but because you're re-educated into that lifestyle by having two lesbian moms, you're actually increasing the chances that you, the child yourself, will become homosexual. So everyone's saying, oh, you're just born that way. No, 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 no. It's a re-education effort. Here's my prediction. In a hundred years, if we continue to allow this recruiting effort across America, All of the children in all of the public schools, if we don't stop this, will be re-educated that this is is a good thing. And I predict in 100 years, 20% of America could become homosexual. God, I can only hope 20% are gay. That'd be awful. Won't someone please think of the children? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, Really. uh, You know know what gets me on on this is, is, you know, could it be possible that these children... Of gay people are gay because being gay is genetic and at least one of their parents, uh, c- you know, one of those people that is their mother or father contribute that gene to them. Of course not, Just Jonathan. Saying. You heard him. The Bible says oh. it. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I must have missed that. Well, last both, my parents, both my parents were heterosexual, so... Yeah, mine, mine too. No, only gay parents create gay children. <laughs> oh, he oh, said it. Right. Well, <laughs> This is an elected think- official, guys. He's smart. Yeah. He knows yeah, things. That's, that's why we elect people. We don't elect people because we could sit down and have a cup of coffee with them. We elect them because they're smart. Yeah, and the whole, the whole, the whole bit about uh, there are less homosexuals in the South because that's where the Bible is. <laughs> and <laughs> is that really the, the direction you want to take this yeah. argument? Because I've got some actual statistics about the South regarding things like poverty, uh, dependence on, on welfare, and, and other things that don't... Obesity? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait that that no wait that, that easy, that's, be, that's, easy. that's because you're atheist that was only caused by atheism as i recall from conservapedia right <laughs> well and and well and not to put too fine a point on it but i mean how many studies i mean if we're talking about quote-unquote sexual morality here how many studies have we seen where they're like yeah the south is pretty much where all the porn is searched for oh yeah i i read about that recently the there's the the highest concentration of porn of gay porn searches in are in the south and, and utah don't tell anybody utah is one of the highest gay porn searches Yes, I'm just you know it's it's just this whole this whole thing about recruiting and how this is being gay is a lifestyle choice. It's 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 all they can say. That's the only way they can refer to refer to us. I guess there's um, mm-hmm. it's it's frustrating. It's it's yeah. the whole like we're gonna we're gonna stick our fingers in our ear and we're gonna go no. 
true. And that's and, and that, that's pretty much their argument. <laughs> and how do you know that the reason that the statistics in the South show less gay people than in California is because people who are gay who live in the South are less comfortable coming out than they are in California. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if we're going to, I mean, if we're going to stop, you know, if we're going to stop just making fun of this guy and, and go serious for a second, I mean, yeah, that's exactly it. Like when you, when you talk about, you know, percentage of the, of the population that are gay or trans or, um, you know, any, any flavor of queer, those numbers can't be trusted because there's so many places where people aren't, not only don't feel safe, but legitimately aren't safe. Right. Coming out. And, and so, he didn't even I mean, cite the study that, uh, that he was referring to. It, it, those numbers could, those numbers can be just completely fabricated. Right. And, and even, even if, if they're, they're not, not, I mean, he's, they're not, yeah, he's, yeah, he's obviously painting them to say something that they don't. Yep. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, Daniel, what's next, my friend? In slightly related news, we have possible 2016 presidential contender, Mike Huckabee, continuing his mission to erase any and all moderate credibility he might have by claiming that the gay rights movement, quote, won't stop until there are no more churches, until there are no more people who are spreading the gospel, end quote. He also accused critics of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of engaging in, quote, true discrimination and seizing on a manufactured crisis. So, first of all, that's not the gay rights movement. That's the atheist movement. And yes, we won't stop. Um, that's that's not true. That, that's a, <laughs> that sounded like a really cool thing to say, but that's not really what it's about. I mean, based on based um, on what? What do they base this on? It, because we, we have never whether I mean, so where are they even getting this? I, I haven't heard anyone, gay or atheist or both, say anything about wanting to completely eradicate churches, uh, no longer give people the right to worship their their own gods, uh, God or gods. It's it's just fear. Well, this is it's fabricated in their head. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is Mike Huckabee positioning himself for a 2016 presidential run. I mean, that's exactly what it is because when Mike Huckabee ran for president the first time, you know, eight years ago, seven years ago. Um, I'm going to be honest and say that I, I thought he was kind of cool. Like he was on, he was on John Stewart's show well, and he's they were very talking charismatic, about charismatic for sure. He's, he was very charismatic and he was reasonable. They started talking about abortion and he said, yeah, you know, I think, I think reasonable people can disagree. I think what's important is that we have the conversation and that we're honest and that we actually listen to be, listen to each other. And I was like, okay. All right, Republican that I'm not immediately pissed off listening to. Like, let's, you know, let's, let's keep this up. Um, yeah. but I mean, he has he, just absolutely demolished that. Yeah. Well, he realized that he wouldn't get any votes from, from his party if he kept up that kind of, which is a sad, sad commentary on the state of the, the right and the Republican party and the country in general that, um, you know, he can't count on votes unless he acts that way. Right. It is absolutely absolutely ridiculous and i mean people who can't tell they're being catered to apparently when because you have a lot of these these uh right-wing folks that are you know um that are campaigning for various positions of office they're they're just going all out on the on the you know super christian super conservative and it's like you guys you know you guys can't tell that you're being absolutely catered to for votes yeah i mean i've I feel that that if they if the in the primaries they act like this, you know, it's going to be hard for them in the general election because most, you know, most people are either in the middle, you know, the people that are in the middle aren't that way, you know, and then the people on the left definitely aren't that way. So when you have something somewhat extreme making it to the general election, I think it's harder for them to backpedal. Well, and and I think that gets back to another sad commentary on the electorate is a lot of times the reason they get away with these kinds of things is because it's only the hardcore conservatives or the hardcore liberals that pay attention to the primaries, right? And once we get to the general election, pretty much all is forgotten. And, you know, the people on the right, obviously, they're just going to pretend like you know, they're going to pretend like everything in the primary didn't happen. And all of the moderate people who don't really pay attention until the general election, well, they weren't paying attention when all the really crazy stuff happened anyways. So they're not really affected by it. I mean, that's, that's like the horrific reality of politics in the United States. Um, Mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, obviously I don't want to do the false equivalent equivalency, like, Oh, Democrats are bad and, and, and Republicans are bad. Both like, you know, obviously they both have their problems, but they are not equally problematic for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, our country's moved so far to the right over the past few years. It's 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 crazy. Of course, you ask my conservative friends, and they believe that it's moved so far to the left. It's crazy. So who knows? Yeah, it's it it's a mess, and um, and it it's I mean, it's only going to get worse. I mean, the the hyperbole, and I am just. This show, <laughs> this show is already sort of exhausting to do sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling I'm going to be ready to sleep for a month after election season doing this show. Oh, geez. We're going to have some fun, aren't we? <laughs> after the, after the, <laughs> during the primaries, just like watching people raise their hands over and over and over again to just be like, no, I'm more of a bigoted jerk. No, I'm more of a bigoted jerk. I hate the gays more. I hate women more. Yeah, and I that's love what God into. more. That's what it's turning to. Who yeah. hates the gay, who I mean, hates gay people is. the most? Who hates gays and women and um, minorities and poor people the most? Can we call it Bigotry 2016? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's that's the <laughs> campaign name. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. And last but most certainly not least tonight, we have Tom Cotton. Oh, Tom Cotton. While discussing the recent Indiana Religious Freedom Bill, Cotton suggested that we queer folks gain some perspective, reminding us that in Iran, people get hanged for being gay. He followed up by saying, it's really wrong to hang gay people because what we should be doing is stoning them to death like the Bible says. Oh, wait. Of course, Tom didn't say that last part. But um, if, if he were being intellectually honest here, he'd have to admit that's what his holy book prescribes to be done to us. I really can't stand that guy. Literally everything he says is awful. And getting back to the, like, Look, guys, you elected this guy. This guy is not a state senator. This guy is in Congress. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I just can't, I just can't stand it because the Bible is just a mess. And, and I'm sorry to say that, but it is. No, <laughs> don't be sorry to say hey, that. This is, this is an issue show. Feel free. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Sorry, so, sorry you, you for that. Sorry honey, if I dis- <laughs> Sorry if I disillusioned our two religious <laughs> listeners or one religious listener. Um, yeah, it's just you know, it's silly the things it says. You know, the the, the you're not even you can't even wear cotton poly blends if you listen to the Bible. So it's just the, this whole idea that you know our our push for equal rights should be should be mocked because look at all that we're asking for, and people in other countries get pushed off of buildings and get hanged, and we should be right. we should somehow be thankful that that's not being done to us. Um, right. I mean, it's literally like me punching you in the face and be like, "Well, dude, at least I didn't shoot you." Yeah, exactly. Like, what are you complaining <laughs> yeah. about? You should be grateful I didn't shoot you. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. The, these kinds of comparisons absolutely, I mean, just absolute. Well, okay. So I was going to say these kinds of comparisons absolutely kill me. Um, but like not even, not even being funny. I mean, the attitude that comes from these kinds of comparisons literally end up with people dead. Yeah, it's violent. And, and not even just from violence, just the dismissiveness of the things that some of us have to go through to live our lives as the people we are. And, 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 to not even be allowed to live our lives as the people we are. I mean, those situations have a body count, mm-hmm. a very high, yeah. horrifyingly high body count. You know, and it's and it's not just it's not just, you know, extreme people like I, I have a good friend in my in my in my school in one of my classes and she was talking about how, you know, she's she's Christian and she was talking about how discriminated against she felt. Oh yeah. Like really? If 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 that was an extremist position I could dismiss it as, you know, oh, well, you know, that's just some fringe group. But I hear this constantly, the, this idea that, you know, oh, it's not a popular thing to be a Christian now. Like, it's not cool to be a Christian. And the whole persecution complex, and and all it is is because the Bible says they're going to be persecuted. So they have to figure out a way to make sure that they are or the Bible's wrong. Right. Um, Not to mention the fact that there are a lot of ways where it feels good to be the one like standing on the moral high ground, even when it's not popular to do so, because everyone wants to brag about having their unpopular opinions. That is such a, oh, that's such a pet peeve of mine. So hipster. I know this isn't popular, guys, but I'm going to say it anyways, because because I I care so little about what's popular. I'm going to make sure I let you know that I don't care before I say this thing that's unpopular. I'm pretty sure that we have the unpopular opinions right now, so you know, I, yeah. I think I think factually you're right, but honestly, I don't care. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't either. But I would love do. for 100 percent of people in the world to agree with my perspectives, at least on 
you know, queer equality and gender equality and racial equality. I would love for those to be popular opinions. And I would feel so much better about life if those were popular opinions. Like, I want those things to be popular. I have no interest in being the persecuted one or the one who's like, well, I'm going to stand for something or I'll fall for nothing. Like, well, yeah, when you talk about persecution that, and, and all that, what you need to do is, ex- is examine where it's actually leading to because their beliefs propagate throughout society and they result in violence and death of uh, queer folks. That's, exactly. that's not, and no one, no Christians aren't being killed or, or um, attacked or assaulted um, or marginalized because of things that atheists are saying about them. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in fairness, there are parts of the world where it's dangerous to be a Christian. Um, the United States sure. is not yeah. one. Speaking sure. strictly yeah. for the United States, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Some places in the um, Middle East, absolutely. And, um, yeah. And, 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 it's, and, usually, and it's, it's usually, when, it's usually, if not always, in a place where, uh, where some, some form of religion dictates that <laughs> they should be. Oh, killed. of course. Of course. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and, and, and the, the, the whole idea of, you know, these, these attitudes, adding to um you know the body count of you know people committing suicide and and violence i mean that's that's a subject that we're going to cover yeah. and uh in a future episode and um, you know the whole idea of uh, you know free speech versus uh human decency is kind of the way i like to frame mm-hmm. it right, um, right. I, you know because i am i am a near absolutist when it comes to free speech but i think we also can't ignore the ugly consequences that that has sometimes and um, you know, have a real conversation about um, if 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 the line currently is drawn in an appropriate place, or if it needs to move one side or the other. I think that's, I think that's an interesting conversation to have. Obviously, outside of the scope of this episode. Yeah, con- consequences right, right. of free speech are just a part of living in a culture in a society. Absolutely, and that's going to do it for Gatheus News this week. We'll be right back after this. Grow your library and your vocabulary without ever looking up from your precious little smartphone. Visit AtheistAudiobooks.com and start listening in minutes. The Child Catchers, Rescue, Trafficking, and the New Gospel of Adoption by Catherine Joyce. That's when the pressure turned ugly. The musics sat her down, Rianne said and asked her what her plan to parent was. In a letter she wrote later, she listed the arguments the musics made. That placing your child for adoption was biblical, so God would bless me abundantly for my decision. That I had too much potential to be a single mother, and God had big plans for me. That they had to hold me to what I said when I first moved in, and finally that it shows you care more for your child when you place them for adoption. Rianne didn't know that consent documents for adoption are not legally binding in Washington State until after birth. Everything was screaming at me to keep my child, Rianne said. Rianne wrote the butler's pastor to request that he help mediate some agreement with the family. The social worker called the butler's and returned to Rianne with a message. They didn't want an open adoption or to send any photos, but they said to tell you, thank you for the gift. The Child Catchers, now available at atheistaudiobooks.com. Get that church experience without the follies of faith. Listen to Community Mission Chapel with Jerry DeWitt, only on Secular Media Network. Welcome back to the Gatheist Manifesto. Our guest this week is Trav Mamone from the By Any Means podcast. Trav is a genderqueer person, and we talked with them about their show and what it means to be genderqueer. Trav, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me here. Awesome. Stoked to have you. So, um, if you could just start off, just kind of give me a rundown. What it, what exactly does it mean to be genderqueer? Well, I think I'll first I'll start with sort of like the official Wikipedia definition. Uh, Sweet. Which is, you know, genderqueer is a catch-all term for gender identities that are not exclusively masculine or feminine. You know, identities that are 
outside gender binary and cis normativity. Um, a lot of identities that go underneath the genderqueer uh, umbrella are, you know, either people who have an overlap of, you know, male and female, um, people who define themselves as either bi-gender or tri-gender or pan-gender, having two or more uh, genders, uh, people who have no gender at all, which is known as, you know, being agender, genderless, uh, neutra, um, gender fluid, which means you kind of go back and forth, or just people who think that neither male nor female really fits them. How I define being genderqueer for myself is, okay, when you're in elementary school and they teach you that if you mix red paint with yellow paint, you don't get something that's half red, half yellow. You get a brand new uh, color, orange. And so the way I describe my gender is if you mix boy with girl, you know, you get me, genderqueer. Wow, that's a really great way of putting it. I'm not sure I've ever had it put quite so succinctly. That's <laughs> awesome. I try to keep my metaphor simple. <laughs> well, it works. <laughs> So, um, so you know, talk to me about, you know, we, we've talked a lot on the show about some of the unique issues that trans people face as opposed to, um, you know, like what the gay community faces. So, um, and, and I know there are issues, um, you know, subsequent to that, 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 um, non-binary people face that the, the rest of, you know, binary identified folks like myself may not experience. So can you sort of run down, um, you know, what that looks like? Sure, sure. Um, now, I should say that a lot of this comes from my own experiences, not necessarily sure. like everyone's experiences. So if I don't mention something that's a huge issue among uh, non-binary people, feel free to email and, you know, correct me. Um, a lot of it has to do, I mean, I should say that one big thing, of course, is bathrooms. Um you know, when you don't really fit into a particular gender, it's like, well, which restroom am I supposed to use, uh, the men's room or the ladies' room? Me, being a designated male at birth, I kind of still look like a guy. I mean, when people still see me, when people see me, they, they still say, uh, sir and he. So I could get away with using the men's room, but... I'm also afraid that, you know, if I'm presenting myself as sort of very effeminate, you know, nails painted, scarf, women's jeans, I'm, I'm afraid that I might get harassed in the bathroom, too. So, yeah, whenever there's like a gender neutral bathroom, I'm like, sweet, there we go. Right. And um, then a lot of times, too, it's. People have a very sort of cis normative um, view of gender. They think that if you look like a boy, you're obviously a boy. If you look like a girl, you're obviously a girl. And so a lot of times, like I said earlier, people still call me sir, people who don't know me, or man. And it kind of bothers me because I think, oh, crap, I'm not, I must not be doing it right. <laughs> right. And, um, yeah, those are some things. And also, of course, you know, when you're filling out forms and they give you only two boxes under sex, uh, male or female, it's like, well, which one am I supposed to pick, you know? I remember I saw this video, it's called The Shit Genderqueer People Say, and this genderqueer person was, like, filling out a form online, and they came to a question, are you a boy or a girl? And they just responded, Yes. But unfortunately, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> unfortunately, not too many people. If you're doing like a formal form, like some sort of, I don't know, health insurance or whatever, they kind of don't really take yes as an answer. <laughs> so right. those are just a few things. Well, yeah, and that's one thing. When I got to talk to Matt Dillahunty, that was something that he brought up, and it was like you know you fill out these forms, and there's male and female, and I mean, how often are you supposed to fill out those forms where it really, really matters? Right, right, exactly. Um, you know, because as far as I can tell, you know, 
when you're interrelating with other people, at least as far as your your physical makeup goes, the only two people it should ever really matter to are you know, someone you're going to have sex with or your doctor. Exactly, yes. And outside of that, it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, your identity obviously does oh, yeah. because it affects how you relate people. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like a lot of times in those, in those, those questions, they're, they're not asking about your gender, you know? So, so, I mean, what do you do in, in those, those times where you only have, uh, a, a male or a female bathroom available? Uh, oh, that is a good question. Um, like I said, I, people still read me as a guy, so I can kind of still get away with, uh, using the men's room. And I know, I know uh, non-binary people who are uh, designated female at birth, and you know they use the ladies' room, but it's still kind of an uncomfortable place to be. You know what I mean? So, it, it, in a perfect world, would it would it just be you know genderless bathrooms? Yeah, that would be that would be good. Um, maybe maybe a single toilet because i'm not really quite sure about everybody taking a crap in the same place at the same time sure sure but uh yeah fortunately there are a couple of there are a lot of small businesses around where i live where there's basically just one gender neutral bathroom and one toilet and so that's always right. good i try to yeah, I, I try sense. to go there more than like you know the big places right so you know the other thing you you talked about is you know being called man or being called sir. So is there is there a gender gender neutral alternative to ma'am or sir? Um. Well, there are s- some. I I saw recently on Tumblr somebody should say we should start going back to calling people cat. Like, uh, <laughs> what's up, cat? Yeah, yeah. Like, dig this cat right <laughs> here. Kind of go back to beatnik language. Um. <laughs> I would be okay with that, I think. <laughs> right, right. A lot of times what I do is I call people hun, which, you know, being living an hour hour and a half away from Baltimore, you get a lot of people calling people hun as a term of endearment. Although a lot of cis right. men don't like being called hun, I've noticed. <laughs> right. I was like, just, make, just making sure, just taking precautions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, because that's... You know, I have a habit of calling people sir or ma'am all the time, and mm-hmm. it's not even necessarily, um, you know, like a deference or respect thing. Like, it's just a general speech habit. Right, definitely. Like, oh, what's up, sir? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, hey, ma'am, good to meet you. You know, like, and, and it's not even, uh, and that's something that I've actually kind of tried to work, tried to kind of work out of my language, mm-hmm. you know, because especially as I spend more time in the queer and trans community, I don't want to assume people's gender. I mean, I don't want to assume people's gender identities, period, but, Especially in the in the the queer and trans community, where I'm likely to meet people who, um, you know, their their gender identity is not necessarily what their expression is, or you know, or or vice versa. So so that's you know that's something that I've that I've worked towards. Um, so so let's talk about pronouns for a second. We talked earlier. You prefer they them theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've we've talked about pronouns on the show before. Um, one of the one of the be a better ally segments we had was from a gender queer person. And that was kind of one of the things that they were talking about was, you know, one, not, not gendering things or people. And the other, then the other was, you know, not using gendered pronouns until you know, until you know what someone's identity is. So can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, why that's important to you and, you know, what it means for you when people respect uh, your, your pronoun preference and your pronoun usage? Once again, I'm just talking about my own experience. Um, sure. For me, for me, I um, pronouns are a big thing because it lets me know that people respect my identity and not only just respect it, but validate it as well. That's the big thing: validation. You know, if you say, you know, oh, I'm not really a man or a woman, people look at you like bullshit. <laughs> you're obviously born with right. a penis. You're a man. I'm going to call you he, him, whether you like it or not. Like, right. no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Um, yeah, although I will say this too. Sometimes it's kind of hard for me to get out of the habit of, you know, automatically assigning pronouns to 
people because I mean, oh, me too. Yeah, I mean, not <laughs> me too. Yeah, I mean, nine out of ten people that I meet in my day to day life because I work in public service. I I work at a public library, and so I'm interacting with people all the time, and and um, I don't. I think I think nine out of ten of them are cisgender. So I could. I, I shouldn't say I should probably get away with it, but it's like I know I, I know what you mean. It's it's hard because you think in a practical sense, you know, trans people in general we're like what, what like one percent of the population, right? And people under that who are gender queer, like almost everyone you meet in your life is going to be cis. So like, <laughs> you know, and in, in in my head the conversation goes, why should I rearrange my entire way of thinking and talking you know for i'm I'm almost never gonna run into people like this in everyday life but then i think to myself like wow that's a really crappy way to think mm-hmm. <laughs> like like i need to be respectful of of people because you never know because it does mean a lot i mean it means a lot to me that people use she right and i have to imagine that for some you know for someone living in a binary world but not being part of the binary i could think i mean i could see it being even more important to someone like you than it is for me so I just think like I just got to get over myself and do it, <laughs> you know. Right, exactly. So, um can you talk to me a little bit about practically how being gender queer has affected your life? Um you know, I can like I can speak to, you know, what it's like to, you know, someone thinking that I'm a boy but actually being a girl or being perceived as male and actually being female and what it's like to try and jump across that um, I, so, but I have to imagine it's an entirely different experience for someone who, um, you know, who doesn't identify on either side of the binary. So could you talk a little bit about that, like in a, in a practical sense, what it's meant for your life? Sure, sure. Um, well, social situations are kind of weird because even when I was a kid, I felt like I could be one of the girls or one of the boys. But I know that a lot of people don't see it that way. Like I can hang out with uh, girls and even you know, even girls who know that I'm genderqueer, but still, if I like, I have to still be careful of what I say because they might interpret that as like, you know, oh, that's, you know, a guy talking, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and it's also, I mean, it's confused a lot of people too, even, even like the most open-minded, uh, friends of mine, you know, like, like um a lot of like when people say okay let me give you an example uh recently uh my biological father was uh, talking about me in good ways on facebook and um he said something like you know i'm proud that my son has become the man slash woman slash whatever that he has become and i'm like eh, you can just call me a person Let's just make it easier for you <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think a lot of times people don't understand how loaded those words can be mm-hmm. because I mean, I know for me when someone says like, wow, oh, you're a good woman. I mean, that is such a validation mm-hmm. for me because, because like you said earlier, it's not just about accepting it. It's about validating it and embracing it and recognizing like, yes, this is who you are. So, you know, as, as someone who is in between the the spectrum i can i can definitely see like that would be <laughs> and it's so hard when people are trying to be nice and they're trying to say good things to turn to turn around and correct them somehow right um you know i <laughs> in a lot of ways i'm an extremely confrontational person and i don't shy away from being like nope you messed up right but when someone's genuinely trying to say something good like i feel so bad <laughs> when i have to turn around and be like that's awesome. Thank you. But quick note. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I do that um, too. I mean, I mean, I'm pretty respectful right. when I do it. I'm like, I'm like, uh, actually, if you can just call me they, them, that's cool. And, and right, they're like, right. okay, that's fine. So tell me about, you know, in, in everyday situations, because, you know, like we talked about before, most people you meet are going to be cis and most of them have a very cis normative attitude. So they're going to assume that, you know, if, if, if they read you as male, they're just going to think you're an effeminate guy, right? right? So they're still going to use he, him, his, um, and they're going to say, you know, man or dude or whatever. So, I mean, 
how do you deal with that in everyday situations? I mean, do you correct people? Do you let it pass? Like, how does that work? You know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I've told a couple of people at work that I consider myself genderqueer and I've sort of described it as, you know, well, if males at this end and females at this end, I'm right in between. They kind of look at me like, um, okay. But I haven't really brought up pronouns yet because I'm not really quite sure how well that'll go over. I mean, most of my coworkers, they're pretty open-minded, but, you know, I, I, there, there's still that little bit of fear. It's kind of like, you know, coming out. Even if your parents are like the most progressive, embracing people in the world, there's still that weird feeling you get that when you come out, people are going to look, your parents are going to look at you like, what? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Or that, you know, I, <laughs> because they'll think like, well, you know, if this is who you are, I support you, but they still look at it as, look at it as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And they kind of internalize like, well, this happened because I messed up something as a parent. Yeah. You know, one thing that I was worried about when I came out because, um, you know, my mom and my dad were never married and my dad was never around in my life. So I was always afraid that my mom was going to think that this was some horrible thing I was going through because her and my dad were never married. Right. You know, and luckily that, I mean, that never really came up. She didn't really think that. So that's good. But you know, I mean, that was something that I was kind of worried about. And I mean, of course, that's, you know, when people are being assholes, a lot of times they'll, they're like, oh, well, you grew up with a, without a dad. You love your mom so much. You just want to be your mom. And I'm like, well, I mean, she's a role model, right. and I love her a lot. But, <laughs> you know, that's that's not what it's about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My mom kind of jokes because on my first birthday, um, um, my Uncle Frank on my dad's side of the family, he's gay. And before I was born, uh, my mom and my dad, when they were still together um, – used to go with my Uncle Frank to gay bars to basically just to show support for him and also sort of, I guess, you know, kind of educate themselves too. So actually on my first birthday, um, there were some uh, gay men that my parents became friends with that attended my party. And my mom jokes saying like, oh, that must have did it. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. <laughs> So, um, so before, before the interview, you said you had some stuff written down that were, you know, subjects that you wanted to talk about. So, um, so, so go ahead and just lead the conversation for a minute. What, what, was there anything specific that you, you think is important to know or that, uh, you know, a topic that you want to bring up? I did recently write a blog post on Queer Rica because I'm a contributing writer there about how to be a better trans ally, how cisgender people, can be better allies for not just trans people in general, but also um, genderqueer people like myself. Uh, I think the m number one rule when it comes to any sort of allyship is listen more than talk. You know, like I've had a lot of, well, I should say that before I became an atheist, I was a part of the emergent uh, church group, which was sort of like a progressive uh, Christian group, and there were a lot of straight cisgender men who felt like it was their duty to sort of take up the banner and be like the Lorax for the LGBTQ community, and meanwhile, actual queer people in the emergent uh, movement were trying to like say, um... Excuse me, hi, I can kind of speak for myself and tell my own story. Why are you telling my story for me? That's not even my story there. It's a lot of more nuanced than just what you're saying. So that's probably the number one uh, tip. Do more listening than talking. And another tip is is do plenty of research, you know, Especially in the atheist community, you know, we we're very science. We have a very like scientific mind, you know, and which which is a good thing too. But a lot of times, I've I've come across a couple of transphobes on Reddit's atheism forum. That when I think actually, yeah, it was when I posted uh, Daniel Moscato's uh, coming out post. And and a couple of people were like, but biology, and so that that tends to be kind of, you know, that tends to 
that that's definitely pisses me off. Um, there was actually a recent study how where like scientists have proved that gender is a lot more fluid than we understand, especially in the mind. Um, there was a recent article um, about a study by the Medical University of Vienna that explains how networks in the human mind determine gender identity. Um, it says that you know trans people had brain chemistry approaching the middle of the gender spectrum, which is you know, which was inherently different from their biological sex and closer to their identified uh, gender. Uh, they found that, for example, a trans woman has significantly significantly different brain movement than a cisgender man, despite having the same biological sex. So. Yeah, there's there's definitely that. And also, um, a major thing, too, which we talked about earlier, use correct pronouns. You know, if someone whom you read as male wants to be referred to as she, refer to her as she. If someone whom you read as female wants, uh, wants to be referred to as he, refer him to he. Um, if someone wants to be referred to as they, refer to them as they. Yes, I know, um, you know, most people think that they is uh, plural, but actually uh, they has been used as a singular pronoun for, for quite a number of years. So, yeah, those are some basic tips. Awesome. Well, yeah, that's um, – and you know, those who listen to the show will notice a recurring theme when we talk about how you can be better trans allies. So you've not only heard it from me, but you've now heard it from Trav. So hint, hint, super important. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Awesome. Well, tell me, uh, tell me where people can go online to find more about you and your podcast. Uh, you can go to www.byanymeans.com. That's uh, by spelled B-I. And um, yeah, there'll be links to uh, the podcast, um, both on iTunes and on Stitcher. And um, and also you can read what I have to say about LGBT rights and secular humanism. And um, I also have a um, I also write for Quirica dot com, Q U E E R E K A dot com. And um, yeah, that's basically the main thing to find. Plus, also I'm on Twitter at Team Amone and uh, and on Facebook as well. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down and talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. I've enjoyed this. I have too. Have a good one. You too. We are given one life full of billions of small and large decisions to be somebody, to change, to be kind, to give hope, to become a better person, and to leave a lasting impact on this planet. It is a decision to be made every single day while your heart is still beating. We've made our decision. Absence of clothing. Atheist and science-based apparel and merchandise. Donating 50% of our profits to charity. Look good and feel good without God. Check us out at absenceofclothing.com and find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr. And welcome back to the Gatheist Manifesto. This week's Be a Better Ally segment is brought to you once again by new friend of the show, Anthony Rose Collins. Anthony wrote powerfully about how we can better be allies to those with physical disabilities last week. And this week we have Anthony's piece about mental disabilities. Anthony writes, You know the horror stories you hear about early human rights activists having feeding tubes shoved down their throats in mental institutions? Or how about the fact that homosexuality used to be categorized as a mental illness? You know how hard we all fight to get conversion camps shut down because of the long-lasting devastation they cause to people in them? Horror stories about queer children being kidnapped by the friends of their Christian parents, taken away from their homes and friends, being forced to pretend they're someone they're not, sometimes even tortured? We, as the queer community, have worked so hard to move away from those days, but we've left so many of our friends and siblings behind. For you, many of these things are a distant horror, but for so many people living in our world today, they're still a very real threat. This month, Autism Speaks is running its infamous Light It Up Blue campaign. 
eBay is donating 25% of its profits to this organization during Autism Awareness Month. Major landmarks are using blue lights to illuminate their structures. Even Easter bunnies come plastered with puzzle pieces. Most of the world neither knows or cares that all this money never hits the pockets of actually autistic people, but instead lines the pockets of the board members and keeps wildly unethical institutions alive. The 25 cents from your Easter bunny may have gone towards the power bill of a kidnapped autistic person's electrocution torture, because that's one of the most common autism treatments. Because that's one of the most common autism quote-unquote treatments. Electrocuting children when they behave poorly, sometimes killing them, and reward them like Pavlov's dog when they do what you want. To this day, many adults can't, can't even look at M&Ms without being reminded of years of torture. One of the founders of Autism Speaks once admitted in front of her autistic child that she seriously considered murdering said autistic child, and it was only the existence of her allistic child that made her reconsider. Thousands of parents and caretakers each year choose to murder their mentally disabled children, convinced that their lives are tragedy. These are young children, many of whom are queer, who after months of terrifying experiences are handed a diagnosis that our society says is a synonym for murderer. They live their whole lives, if they are lucky enough not to be murdered or sent away, seeing the rest of the world treat them as if there is already blood on their hands, simply because they occasionally hallucinate. Mental disability knows no gender orientation. Being an ally to the mentally ill means setting down the stigma. It means stopping the human rights battle cries that separate you from them. Never again say that being gay doesn't mean you're crazy. Never say you'd have to be a sociopath to deny others their rights. Recognize that the mental health community is your own community, that for every horror you've suffered, we have and are still suffering 10 times the pain. Being an ally means learning from autistic people what autism is. It means learning the difference between schizophrenia and sociopathy and psychopathy. It means learning what the DSM is, learning about how diagnostic criteria are geared towards white males as the default brain. It means an endless journey of learning the truth and unlearning fear. Being an ally means learning that centuries of genocide and eugenics cannot get rid of us. They can only make the human race weaker as a whole. And as with last week, I'm not going to presume to add to that because that sort of thing is something I'm far less educated and experienced on. And I'm just super excited to have found someone who's willing to share on the topic. Once again, Anthony, thank you so much for your contribution. That was extremely, extremely powerful. If you're a listener and would like to suggest a topic for a Be a Better Ally segment, please do reach out. The address is thegatheistmanifesto at gmail.com. And uh, so before we close things out tonight, I got a message from a friend of mine I wanted to pass along. In episode six, I said that I wasn't sure what marriage laws look like for me as a trans woman, given that I can't have my birth certificate amended in my home state of Ohio, which puts my birth certificate and driver's license in conflict with one another. So my friend Sarah reached out to me because she has in fact done that research, and here's what she found. Apparently in my home state of Ohio, my right to get married is at a judge's discretion. The county I live in apparently has a slightly more progressive judge who uses your driver's license, but if I happen to end up wanting to marry a woman, I still wouldn't have the right to do that because same-sex marriage is of course still illegal in Ohio. There are also several states um, where you can't get your birth certificate amended, like Ohio, and the other ones aside from Ohio are Tennessee, Idaho, and Kansas. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and fully 26 states require that you prove you've undergone bottom surgery to permit amending your birth certificate, which is pretty horrifying. Um, either way, thank you, Sarah, for reaching out with that. That's super valuable info. And with that, kids... It's a wrap on another episode of the Gatheist Manifesto on Secular Media Network. I want to thank my co-hosts, Jonathan and Daniel. Yay! My pleasure. And I want to thank our guest, Trav Mamone, for taking the time to talk to us. You can find us online at facebook.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto. I'm on Twitter at Gatheist Cali. Hi, Daniel. I'm on Twitter at Daniel Wolfsong. And I, Jonathan, am on Twitter at NerdCub, N-E-R-D-K-U-B. So before we go... I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one understands and no one cares, you need to know there's a community out there who loves you and knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. Please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is The Gatheist Manifesto.